and we will start our program. All right, hello everyone from Boston. Uh, thank you so much for joining this event in the American Inspiration Author Series presented by American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society in partnership with the State Library of Massachusetts. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us today in the land of history, culinary history. I'm Margaret Talkett, the producer of literary programs at American Ancestors NEHGS and part of its Brew Family Learning Center. On your screen is the schedule for our hour long event featuring Anne Willen and her recently published book, Women in the Kitchen. Ms. Willen will be joined by Cheryl Julian, a fellow cook and culinary celebrity. Beth from the State Library and I will share our guest credentials in a few moments, but for now, some housekeeping items. We are in a Zoom webinar format, which means your microphone is muted and your video is off. We cannot take your comments over the chat button at the bottom of your screen, but you should look there for links and tips related to today's discussion. We asked for your questions as you registered, but if you have additional queries, please enter them into the Q&A button and we'll get to all that we can. This afternoon's program is being recorded by my colleagues here at the Brew Family Learning Center. The video will be published in the days ahead on the American Inspiration website and also on our educational pages. We are going to Zoom email you when the video is posted and live for your sharing. That email will also include some of today's chat links, so never fear, uh, and do keep uh, an eye out for follow-up emails. Of course, the real pleasure comes from reading Ms. Willen's book with its richly illustrated recipes and with its tidbits from history. Copies of Women in the Kitchen can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You'll see on the screen their coupon code AMINS20, which is also being placed in the chat. If you use the code as you order online, you'll receive a signed copy of the book. We have a limited number of these book plates uh, crossing the ocean from England. Um, this autographed cookbook history, it could be the perfect gift for you or for cooks that you know. Uh, we thank Ann Willen for arranging these signed book plates. And we also thank our partners at Porter Square Books, as well as our media sponsor for this afternoon, The Cook's Cook an online <laughs> gathering of cooks, food writers, and recipe tasters of people with an interest in food worldwide. You can join them online at thecookscook.com. Moving quickly to start, uh, some background on our featured guests. Anne Willen founded La Varenne Cooking School in Paris in 1975 and has written more than 30 books, including The Country Cooking of France, which won two James Beard Awards, the Cookbook Library, which earned the Gourmand Award, La Varenne Pratique, and as well, the Look and Cook series, which was showcased on PBS. In 2013, she was inducted into the James Beard Foundation Awards Hall of Fame. Miss Willen serves as an emeritus advisor for the Julia Child Foundation of Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. And now to introduce our moderator, over to you, Beth, and welcome. Thank you, Margaret, and a quick hello from the State Library of Massachusetts, where I am the head of Special Collections. We're very glad to be here tonight for this virtual discussion of Anne Willem's new work, since the topic has an appeal to everyone who's interested in food. And the cookbook authors she discusses have some very local connections. We know that all the members of the State Library of Massachusetts Author Talk community will learn a lot tonight from the perfect author to illustrate so well a topic that we all want to know more about. So now I'd like to introduce Cheryl Julian, who will be discussing Ann Willen's book with the author. Our moderator tonight, again, Cheryl Julian, is a name well known to many of us in the Boston area and to many of us in the audience who love to cook and to eat. She has a unique set of talents in cooking with training in London and Paris, in food styling, including workshops, in the Boston area, food writing, including many years as the award-winning food editor of the Boston Globe, 
an author and editor of several cookbooks herself and teaching, including in the gastronomy master's program at Boston University. So who could be better for today's conversation? So we now will welcome Ann Willem and Cheryl Julian to the screen to start our program. The curtain opens, Ann. Am I online? You're, the stage is yours, Ann, yes. The moment I'm online. Yes, you can just take um, um, us through. This is the frontispiece of a very early cookbook, Hannah Woolley, um, just after the Great Fire of London. And Cheryl sent me a, a question about why did Hannah Woolley write her cookbook? Well, I think that after the Great, that the impetus to put your knowledge on paper is um, oh, essential to all authors and particularly when you're trying to define a practical skill um, that you hope um, you can pass on to other people. And Hannah Woolley, uh, the great fire must have emphasized the fleeting nature of delicious food and the ability to oh, produce it in the kitchen and to explain how to do it, but in a, a much broader sense of giving pleasure to people, um, expressing the flavors and the habits and the ways of doing things and serving dishes and holding um, events at the dinner table. And here you can see the, um, on the frontispiece of the book, you can see them cooking. It's quite interesting what they're wearing. They've bundled up their hair. Very important to keep, you wanted to keep your um, hair clean um, and also to keep it away from the flame of, of what in those days, and you can see at the bottom right, uh, was an open fire. And the cook um, is bending over the open fire and I mean, really has to watch out. Um, the women, and they're all women, hitch up their skirts so that they don't um, drag on the floor. They're wearing slippers to protect their feet. And you can see them doing nice little, the lady at the top on the right is molding um, what might be a pat of butter. Because of course, everything possible was made at home, grown at home, made at home, um, raised at home, chickens in the backyard, vegetables in the patch at the back. That was all the responsibility of the cook. Uh, Anne, can I yes. ask you to, um, to, to go a little faster so that we can have our conversation? Uh, sure. Questions, that'd be lovely, thank you. Let's go on to Hannah Glass, uh, one of the most beautiful cookbooks um, ever printed. This is nearly a century later than Hannah Glass, beautiful book, pleasure to read. She comes from Yorkshire, very close to where I was born and brought up. 
And then I have to. Amelia Simmons. Yes. American cookery. I yes, but I can't move on. Oh, well, someone's going to move on for you. Oh, okay. okay. That's great. Oh, we missed Mr. Amelia Simmons, oh, but, okay. I, but she okay. is very important mm -hmm. because Amelia Simmons, that's this little book here, but we need to go one over, um, is the first American cookbook. And I have the best, next best thing right here, which is the plagiarized um, edition of uh, Amelia Simmons was 1796, and this is 1808. Lucy Emerson, word for word, the same as Amelia Simmons, and you can get a very close feeling for the simplicity of books of the time. And just the general, oh, very appealing kind of efficiency. And it does have a little Amelia Simmons. The only thing we know about her is that she was an orphan, which she states on her title page. Then we're going to go to the next slide. Go to the neck to the next one. Just great. Now, Mrs. Rundle is much more what we think of as a comprehensive cookbook. She wrote this for her daughters. It's um, quite a solid volume. It has sort of everything you need to know in the um, early 19th century kitchen. Then the famous Lydia Child, who was much more a politician than a cook. But um, in one of her books, she does include 40 recipes. She wrote a great deal um, on all of these um, early American books. Mrs. Rundle, of course, was English, but um, was distributed in the States and widely read. Um, all of the early American cookbooks came, covered New England. Then um, one of the first of the Southern cookbooks, The Carolina Housewife. And then um, is a wonderful picture of of the entertaining of um, a great lady, of a grand um, quite wealthy and um, oh. housekeeper, um, lady of the house. By now, the author of the cookbook was quite often not, not much in the kitchen, um, but was supervising and particularly in the South, would have had, if not slaves, um, servants who were doing all that hard stuff um, of chopping and slicing and cleaning the pots and pans, as well as the fun stuff of the cooking, or what we think of, or what I think of and hopefully everybody else does the fun stuff about the cooking. And then the next slide, please. 
Thank you. Now, Fanny Farmer um, was an amazing woman. I'm sure, particularly those of you who are centered around Boston know, know lots more about Fanny Farmer than really do I do myself. Um, many of you will have cooked from Fanny Farmer. She was a pioneer, not so much of recipes of, well, of recipes of the dishes, but um, of, oh, of the, the recipe writing of the layouts of the recipes, how to, and we still follow it, of course, the title, a nice little note to pull you into the recipe, the ingredients listed, followed by the method. Um, and it was Fanny who really established that pattern. Then the joy of cooking, Irma Romba, that so many people across America. Now, this was really the first book that pretty well every household who was interested in food and had enough money to spend on cookbooks would have had a copy of Joy of Cooking in the kitchen. And it, um, it covers not only regional cooking, um, but it covers dishes from all over America. It shows um, 1930s and, of course, editions successively updated ever since. A basic cookbook with American favorites from all over the place that are easily easy to transpose no matter where you're living in the States. Then. Two beautiful brunettes. Julia Child and Anne Willis. Uh -huh. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure how we get to include Julia. This uh, she's, is on, Julia she's, on, she's on our screen, Anne. We can see her. Oh, good. Yes. This is Julia and me when we were giving classes at the Greenbrier in West Virginia. And that sums up um, Julia fr uh, from California, me from Europe, though a naturalized American. And there we are in the mid or the corner of West Virginia, teaching a wide audience from all over the states. That'll be from ooh, 20 years ago, more than that. 30 we're gonna, years we're gonna talk a little more about, um, about Julia. So we can, you and I are going to, I hope. Uh, so we can flip the uh, screen and go on to the uh, another slide. That's good. Edna Lewis, wonderful, wonderful character. Fascinating picture of a very different aspect from previous American cookbook writers. Um, a Virginian of the other side of, oh, the other side of the page in a way. But Edna had that wonderful instinctive understanding of cooking and eating and of place and of ingredients and of the heritage that is very rare to find a cook conveying on the 
on the page. Marcella Hazan, totally different line of, well, Italian, but these are the immigrants like myself, though I've never written an English cookbook. Um, I've always written about French cooking, which would bring us in a minute to Julia. But Marcella was a wonderful evocation in the States of what she was brought up with that she managed to convey to um, New York and indeed nationwide. And then we have Alice who has gone out um, and as an American who like me fell in love with France, um, who has brought everybody back to the garden and simplicity and an instinctive feeling for ingredients and for keeping in touch with the soil. Well, Anne, I think it's time for us to have a conversation. And, yes, that'd be good. Um, and I uh, let's just uh, wait until we both pop up on the screen together. Uh, and uh, I, I thought we'd just start with France. Uh, you went to France to uh, to the Cordon Bleu, uh, and uh, I sort of wonder, like, what were your parents thinking? You had uh, you had a degree in mathematics from the University of Cambridge, Cam or do I say Cambridge University or University of Cambridge? University of Cambridge University. Cambridge University. But you have to say Cambridge, England. Okay, of yes. course, well, where we are, yes. absolutely. And uh, and you you had been to the Cordon Bleu in London, you had taught there, uh, you had taught at Constance Spry, you did hat making and glove making, I saw yes. some of your products. Yeah. Um, and I then didn't you went pursue off to, either of those. Yes. <laughs> then you went off to Paris to learn to cook. What were your parents thinking? Oh, my parents, my father said, after all that education, what are you now a cook he said mm -hmm. but when i started writing books and 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 um expanding <laughs> things and opened a cooking school uh, much further down the road in paris he came round and he thought it was less of a of a waste of a good education oh, dear. but i went to france because for me, even though I'd been teaching for two years at the Cordon Bleu in London, um, France oh, is like going to Italy to learn um, op to study opera, or Germany to study um, music, and, and that's where you go to learn from the people who've really been steeped in food and cookery and the joys of good eating since they were born. Mm -hmm. And you learned French in France, or did you know it before you went? Well, I'd been taught schoolgirl French. Mm -hmm. And so I um, got a job as an au pair girl in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And so my French is still pretty fluent before going the Cordon Bleu is still pretty fluent but has a strong Swiss, Swiss accent. Um, so but, when, you, when, you, when you met Julia, uh, was it the Cordon Bleu that you had in common besides, you know, cookbooks and writing and... It turned out to be, but I didn't meet Julia until much later. Um, Julia had been at the Cordon Bleu the, in Paris, same one, Say a different chef, mm -hmm. um, but only one chef uh, 10 years before. And we had very similar experience 
Um, Julia was in with the American GIs. I was in with um, would-be Americans a bit like me, though I was originally English, um, who wanted to learn French cooking at the source. Mm -hmm. And so I went for three months and stayed for two years and mm -hmm. um, put an ad in the Herald Tribune um, offering cooking classes and um, cooking for dinner parties and cooked among other places um, and taught the Mexican chefs at the Chateau de Versailles. Yes. And I lived 72 steps under the eaves of the El Colbert. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you and your dear husband, Mark, uh, started your cookbook collection with Hannah Glass's Art of Cookery. Um, I wonder, it was a serious investment for a young married mm -hmm. couple. And, mm -hmm. and what, what was the idea? It must've been a bit of a puzzle to figure out what she was teaching. Uh, you write that the um, uh, the S's look like F's and uh, sort of puzzle together. So what? Yes, what... that was Mark, and you you, you know Mark. Um, my husband was very intellectual, and he said, "Sweetie, if you're going to write about cooking, you um, must have cookbooks." And at that date, I had Escoffier, I had Le Livre de Cuisine de Lalibab, and I had the Cordon Bleu cookery course from London, and that was it. And Mark started collecting cookbooks after we were married um, with Ellen Lowenstein, a name that will be familiar to many of you who wrote the um, definitive bibliography of um, American early American cookbooks. And he and Eleanor used to have these conversations. Um, and Mark started from that and put together oh, a really landmark collection that is now where it, um, if anyone wants to consult it on the West Coast, is at the Getty Museum in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. You also, didn't you also own Madame Saint-Ange? Because the woman that you worked for, a woman that you worked for told you that all the French housewives had a copy. <laughs> You've just reminded me of something. Indeed, <clears throat> I lived for a year in a French household they very kindly um, let me live in their maid's room. And Marielle was a, 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 a wonderful, simple French cook. She would cross parrots to get the very best fresh chickens that came from Normandy. And she picked up um, the cream to go with it and um, that kind of thing. And her cooking was just very simple, three or four ingredients, but perfect. And of course, the simpler something is, it's like couture clothes. The simpler it is, the more difficult it is to um, recreate. Mm -hmm. So let's go across the pond to the US and um, Amelia Simmons, um, she, uh, she, she essentially offered a guide to running a prosperous household. Um, I was amused that some of her advice was uh, when the butcher delivers the meat, weigh it first, count mm -hmm. the loaves of bread. Um, it's, nice, what, uh, it? it's what restaurants do today. You know, when yes. you come into the back of a restaurant, you look at every single thing and see what you've got. Or they they can't stay in business if they've been shortchanged, you know, uh, pounds of meat every day. Well, it, it it's advice to a prudent housewife. Mm -hmm. And Amelia Simmons, indeed. I mean, I'm not sure how many pages 
um, of text it is, but she talks about how to choose fish and meat and how to grow parsley through the winter in the cellar and just generally how to run um, oh, the overall background to a really prosperous and not, that does not at all necessarily mean expensive mm -hmm. prosperous kitchen mm -hmm. with a wide variety of ingredients that are all um, carefully looked after and carefully stored. Mm -hmm. One of our um, viewers online uh, wants to know um, how American were Amelia Simmons recipes because weren't her all of her techniques generally European, French, Spanish, um, and not American because what, what was American cooking at the time? Well, it what she describes must have been New England cooking, mm -hmm. um, which was very much what I call American colonial cooking. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was ingredients that would be familiar to mm -hmm. almost everyone in England. Um, oh, it's roasts and braises and great big cakes. There's a wonderful, she calls it an independence cake. Mm -hmm. Lovely American name. Mm -hmm. um, she is the first to use corn in recipes. Hmm. Uh, there are three recipes uh, the, 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 that use an ingredient that was not familiar on the other side of the Atlantic. Right, and, and we should probably, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows this, uh, about finding corn here and, and, and not, it wasn't accepted in um, the colonists' kitchen. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a first, and indeed, the, the three recipes um, there's an Indian pudding, um, and there are, I think, hoe cakes, and there's one other, um, are instanced often in books about early American cooking. Mm -hmm. And another viewer wants to know about standardized measurements, uh, uh -huh. and that was Fanny Farmer, very precise, very scientific. Oh, mother of level measurement. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have trouble with Fanny Farmer. Why? Well, in the sense that I don't sort of altogether approve of all this level measurement and precision and it's in the hands and But what about baking? You have, to be, and... you have to be precise while you're baking. What about baking? Yes to a certain extent. But um, I mean, early cooks didn't measure, well, they didn't measure things by volume or by weight. They would just take a couple of handfuls of flour and a piece of butter and rub it in and then add the, add the water gradually. And that would be short crust pastry, of course. Um, what I call short crust pastry. Uh, people didn't measure things and the world divides in two halves, I always say. Um, either you're a pastry cook, in which case you measure everything and are very precise, or you're a cuisine cook, which is like me, that likes throwing in things that happen to be about and you think would be an interesting idea. I have a whole drawer of more of more than 50 um, dried herbs and seasonings in tin jars. I mean, the jars are mine. And um, I just open the drawer and pick something out and add it to the fish or whatever it is mm -hmm. I happen to be cooking. Mm -hmm. um, that's cuisine. And one day it's oil and the next day it's butter and 
Mm -hmm. I want to talk for a minute um, uh, about uh, Marcella Hazan. She was famously cantankerous. Yes. Um, I don't think anybody ever <laughs> mentioned that until um, until it, it, it got to a terrible point. Uh, and uh, she wrote the classic Italian cookbook 50 years ago, which, mm -hmm. which I think we can all agree, as you say, introduced Americans to real Italian cooking, not yes. just Italian American spaghetti and meatballs. Um, Julia was very dismissive of Marcella. Uh, and, well, and I expect Marcella had been rude to her. I, I mean, so it Marcella had was. It had nothing to do with the the fact that she didn't like Italian cooking, or she didn't like the woman. Oh, well, yeah, yes, but it wasn't. It was one of Marcella's books that somebody had said to Julia. I'm sure you love Marcella's um, Italian cooking. A cookbook, I think it is. Um, and Julia felt that it was um, too simple and did not have the detail and intellectual sophistication of French cuisine. And I say cuisine deliberately. One was cooking, the other at its more sophisticated levels is cuisine. So you obviously agree with Julia. I, of course, agree with Julia. But um, the France, you get um, oh, regional cooking, which indeed you do in Marcella, but you also get classical cooking, you get um, modernist cuisine, you get all sorts of variations um, using ingredients in different ways, but all with an intellectual structure mm -hmm. of the techniques mm -hmm. um, and the ingredients behind it. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a couple audience questions. Uh, one is, um, how do you think that Hannah Woolley um, had the foresight to, to write that first cookbook? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, because thinking about it, I think that the, uh, it's not unlike the current pandemic, the uncertainty of the times after the Great Fire of London. It, this is not so long after um, Charles II, uh, the monarchy had been replaced. Um, I think she may have felt that it's important to pass on to to uh, record and pass on to others a knowledge that may otherwise disappear. Hmm. Well, that's that's pretty remarkable. Um, I hmm. wanted to ask another. But that's total supposition. Nowhere does she say that. Well, I think, Anne, your supposition is probably <laughs> quite, according your instincts are probably quite good about all this. Well, that's an, that's an interesting follow on. Are we going to have a collection of post pandemic cookbooks? Well, I think we will, yes. Hmm. Um, another um, another uh, question. Uh, from the audience, um, Lydia Child, who was uh, also from Massachusetts, born in Medford, Massachusetts, um, was a, um, a civil rights leader. She supported Native American mm -hmm. rights. She was way ahead of her time. Women's education, women's freedom told opinions. Uh, and she was the author famously of Over the River and Through the Wood to Grandfather's mm -hmm. House We Go. 
um, her volume, The Frugal Housewife, um, you know, it seems sort of, uh, it seems sort of ironic because the real story is that she spent very little time in the kitchen. And yes, that <laughs> is the real story. to hire anybody and come cook for her. But she, um, oh, she was writing an encyclopedia, a domestic encyclopedia, um, to enable an, an untrained housewife to run her house. And that had to include some cooking. And actually, there are only 40 recipes in our book. But um, they're pretty simple, but they're very good. I was surprised because I think of her as an intellectual and uh, 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 oh, uh, pioneer. As, as, yes. I mean, a politician, really. Well, so, I'm very concerned with social, uh, uh, yes, social problems. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. But she also could cook. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone else from the audience wants to know what you think of microwave cooking. I keep it for the cop to reheat the coffee. <laughs> there was a huge, great, clunky microwave that took up a whole corner of this pre-fitted kitchen mm -hmm. when I moved in here three years ago. Mm -hmm. And I now have four drawers of useful kitchen equipment and no microwave. Where the microwave used to be. Where the microwave used to be. Okay. Um, so I have to reheat my coffee if I do on top of the stove. Okay. I, I just want to remind our, our guests, uh, if anyone has a question, to put it into the um, Q&A at the bottom of your screen. It should be way at the bottom on the right-hand side. But don't press leave because we're not quite done. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk for a minute about um, Alice Waters and Chez Panisse. Um, she was a groundbreaking uh, mm -hmm. uh, chef. Um, uh, you know, our country relied entirely on gardens and neighborhood farmers to supply us with food from the very beginning. And then we had a, a time mid uh, century mm -hmm. when everything was canned and processed and frozen and uh, really the more the merrier. Uh, I think American housewives just went crazy with that. And Alice Waters brought everybody back to this idea of seasonal yes. and, and good ingredients and you don't have to do anything if the ingredients are good. As you said about the woman you cooked for in France. Yes. Uh, but, you know, my question is, you and I can do this. I, I, I go shopping and, and my meat comes from one place and my vegetables come from another and my groceries come from another. Uh, we, we, we can do this because we have the passion and the means, but what about the rest of the world? They must go to buy the cheapest food wherever it is. Big families, people who now don't have paychecks. Uh, people who are living on a very strict weekly budget and, and hopefully if they need it, subsidized. Is seasonal eating only for people who, who, who can afford it? Is that, is that what it's come to? Well, I do hope not, but it is very visible that we, I have a high street just up the road. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Farmers markets, unlike California when I was living there, I mean, the resurgence of farmers markets, I think is lasting and continuing. Mm -hmm. But of course, in Northern America and East Coast, in winter, it's too cold. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you do have to reply, uh, rely on oh, the big supermarket chains mm -hmm. very often. 
Uh, I think it's up to us to get across somehow by buying, by being discriminating mm -hmm. and buying fresh lettuce, not pre-washed lettuce in a packet. Mm -hmm. um, that we do understand that there is a difference between what appears to be sort of acceptable and what is really a different standard, a higher mm -hmm. standard. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else wants to know that what the fate of cookbooks is now. Uh, uh, first of all, all the publishing houses are merging. There's one, you know, big crisis right now with one mm -hmm. big publisher wanting to eat up another. Uh, and so many people going online. Um, I, I can't tell you how many friends of mine uh, will, will say something like, um, you know, I got the recipe online, I saw it on YouTube, I found it on a blog. Um, there are very talented people writing cookbooks today. And what, what's, what's going to happen? Um, if, if it's just so easy to pull a recipe off and off, off a blog or off YouTube. And I think a lot of those recipes are cribbed from the real writers. Very likely, I don't want to say very likely, yeah. but possibly. Um, well, that's classic plagiarism, which well, we could have a whole hour yeah. on talking about. Um, I think we'd need two hours to talk about Plagiarism apart. Yeah. Um, oh, I think one should pick familiar names, Elizabeth, David, um, oh, the New York Times cookbooks your own cookbooks show. Thank you, Anne. Amanda Hesser has just redone the New York Times cookbook. Yes, I have a, um, it's a whatever you call it, Found a review copy mm -hmm. on my coffee table. And it's a huge, great, thick book. And I'm sure it's terrific. Mm -hmm. um, go for familiar and well-loved uh, names and possibly recipes that are more or less familiar. Mm -hmm. I mean, crazy combinations. There's usually a reason that it sounds to be a crazy combination. It's not very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now um, I have one last question. Um, this is a hypothetical situation that I think you've probably found yourself in many times. Uh, you invite good friends at the last minute for a Sunday night dinner. What's on the menu? Oh, goodness, roast chicken. Of course. I mean, assuming I can um, yeah. go out and do some shopping. Yes. Nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we should. We would. Oh, well, we would end with Bruno's chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. Bruno is a wonderful chef who was professionally trained in France. He um, is an albino and legally blind hmm. and he cooks um he has to bend kind of within 12 inches of the counter and um one and he knows all my grandchildren because he cooks for the family sometimes um and the children said oh is Bruno, can Bruno make a chocolate cake? 
And so I said to Bruno, how about a chocolate cake? And it has, I think, four ingredients and it takes something like 12 minutes to cook. And it's a wonderful recipe oh. and happy to pass it on yeah. if there's any way of doing it. Okay, um, maybe you can send it to us and, 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 yes. um, and the library will post it. Um, and finally, um, one last, one, one really, la this is really the last question. Um, is the Getty uh, collection uh, your, your, yours and Mark's uh, cookbooks at the Getty collection, are they open to the public or is yes. that just for academic research? No, they're open to the public. But of course, you need a reader's card. I mean, you need a, to be a and member of. Yes, I absolutely. Okay. okay. And okay. there are some very rare books in there. So those are kept in a separate place, but you only have to ask for them. Okay. And, okay. They'll, and they catalog, mm -hmm. I think I'm right, will now be online. Okay, very good. They very were cataloging it. And it, took, it was taking two years, but I think it'll be on the, online now. Very exciting. Uh, we're welcoming back Margaret uh, into the conversation. What a wonderful conversation you two had. Um, really, you two are such remarkable women, both of you, and we are so lucky to be hearing from you. Um, so thank you for all your wisdom. And many of us could be here with you all day. Um, but unfortunately, we have to continue on, and I really enjoyed each of your stories, and I will be watching the video myself for sure. I would uh, like to add that Cheryl and I first met something like 50, 60 years ago, more possibly. Wow. wow. I mean, we've known each Fantastic. other and, and it, worked Cheryl together. Cheryl wasn't born then, so you know, <laughs> oh, you met her mother, oh. right? So. No, I, it's, I, and you two worked together, I understand, Cheryl, for yes, years. Yes, we did. We worked yes. for many years together. Yeah, no, that's, um, lucky you, lucky yes. you. And, and really, uh, really, both of you. Um, so as the audience knows, we um, so often ask all of our um, authors to read a small passage. And Anne, I know you've picked something out um, to read, to inspire us. And I know you have a tiny bit of a family story in there, which my organization loves. Um, so please go right ahead and do a this little reading is and come back. What I wrote about Amelia Simmons. Amelia Simmons appears out of nowhere as the writer of the first American cookbook. She has no direct links to predecessors in print on either side of the Atlantic. And that's quite rare that she was a loner, an independent spirit who on the title page of American Cookery describes herself as an orphan. There's no evidence that she had access to any other printed cookbook, though copies of Hannah Glass's The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy would have been in circulation in America at that time. Amelia Simmons and American Cookery being um, 1796. Um, American Cookery harks back to a simpler, more demanding time of subsistence, of living off the land and making do with what you had. Meat and poultry were luxuries, vegetables strictly seasonal, and even common spices like cinnamon were carefully hoarded. These restrictions take me back to my World War II childhood in rural Yorkshire. And that's so lovely and so um, indicative of what this book has in it. Such uh, amazing history and then followed by recipes um, for the modern kitchen. Uh, which is so it's, it's fan, fantastic to be able to cook um, and fantastic to be able to hear your stories of these authors and also to hear about your book collection. Thank you so much for being with us and for getting us all inspired for the holidays. We're so it's lovely to be with you and talk about what we all enjoy so much. 
Indeed, indeed. I just want to remind folks that copies of Women in the Kitchen can be purchased through our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. If you use the code MINS20 as you order online, you will receive a signed copy. Um, Anne and her fabulous um, assistant, Allie, have worked to sign book plates this morning, and they're going to ship them over the sea. Um, to Porter Square Books. Uh, we have a limited number of them, um, but we, we have a good number. So do put in an order if you would like that uh, for yourself or for a Christmas gift. Um, you can be assuming that you're gonna get a signed book, a book lady book, unless you hear from the folks at Porter Square. If they run out of stock, they'll certainly let you know. So thank you to Porter Square and thank you to the generous folks at thecookscook.com, their online community of cooks, food writers and recipe tasters. Um, they've helped to promote today's talk. Uh, Denise Landis, who runs that, works closely with Amanda Hesser uh, and did work on that New York Times cookbook. Uh, so we're all grateful for your work, Denise, and your team. And um, Beth, I know you have some resources to share from the library, so go ahead. I do, and thank you to both of our presenters tonight. Although the subject matter tonight was very different from the State Library's usual Massachusetts history-focused topics, this book has a, it's a universal appeal that brings together history and culture and food and through your work, you've certainly given us all much to think about. So I hope that both of our speakers tonight and everyone in our audience tonight will feel very welcome to visit us in the State Library after the Massachusetts State House reopens. Please know that we're currently providing services virtually. So we invite all of our viewers today to start with our website to learn about our resources, our services, and our really great collections. You can type in a simple version of our URL, mass.gov slash lib. That will take you right to our homepage. So the collections at the State Library cover a wide variety of formats and topics. So again, most of our holdings cover Massachusetts history and government, and much of it is available in our digital repository. You're welcome to contact us for help with your research questions. And again, the, the mass.gov slash LIB is the best place to start. So we have one more event scheduled for November, and we are working now on a whole new series of programs for the end of this year and early next year. So please do watch our website for news about upcoming events. There's a, always something new and interesting on our social media too. But on Monday, November 22nd at 7 p.m., we'll join with our colleagues from the Tewksbury Public Library and other Massachusetts libraries to hear from author and artist Barry Van Dusen about his book, Finding Sanctuary, an artist explores the nature of Mass Audubon. This book has gorgeous watercolors as you can see from the cover image here. And it illustrates a topic that's important to all of us, especially those of us here in Massachusetts. So we hope you can join us for that event. Many thanks to all of you for being here tonight. So Margaret, Back to you for tonight's closing remarks about from American Ancestors. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have presented tonight's author talk with you. Um, if you out there in the audience are researching history, especially your family or someone else's, you'll find our library and education center to be useful. Our stacks on Newbury Street are open and NEHGS members can visit our digital archives anytime. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists. You'll see in the cubes on screen some great educational programs coming up from the Brew Family Learning Center, including my favorite, a virtual program tomorrow at 4 p.m. We're gaining a curator's view and tour of famous New England buildings influenced by the China trade. And for you literary sorts, join us for more free author talks in the American Inspiration series. Next Tuesday, November 9, our focus is on the Transcendentalist Movement and Concord, Massachusetts, past and present. Our springboard for discussion is the latest work of historian Robert A. Gross. He'll be joined by Cindy Brockway of the Trustees, and their conversation will be about the lives and world of such luminary thinkers and authors as Emerson, Thoreau, and Alcott. The event is co-presented with the Trustees and the Boston Public Library. On Monday, November 15, we're hosting a conversation about adoption 
if you, your family, or your tree going generations back, uh, if they've been touched by adoption, you won't want to miss hearing from these experts. Uh, the panel should be great. The course that they're bringing together will take you right up to speed on researching adoptions today and yesterday. And finally, in another midday program with a guest also from England, we're looking at the remarkable women in one famous English military family, the Howes. Indeed, the men fought for the British at the Bunk Battle of Bunker Hill and Fort Ticonderoga, but the women had measurable impact on the American Revolution. One of them negotiated with Benjamin Franklin over a series of chess games in London. So don't miss author Julie Flavelle in conversation with the award-winning historian, uh, Mary Beth Norton, a friend and a member of NEHGS. Our mission in all we do is to educate, inspire, and connect. So please do come back. Okay, back to today, to Anne's great work uh, of culinary history. Anne and Cheryl, we thank you for joining us and enlightening us on the history of cooking and cookbooks. I so enjoyed your personal stories and both of you as women trailblazers and uh, with such good taste. Uh, Beth and I are really glad we have copies of Women in the Kitchen so we can get to work cooking and eating. And to today's audience, thank you so much for tuning in. It was a bit of an odd time, but we're just, it's the only way to get such remarkable folks as Ann Willen from overseas. Um, from all of us women on screen and from more women behind the scenes in Boston, in London, across the puddle, we wish you all a good afternoon and fabulous holidays ahead. We'll hope to see you soon again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.